Hello everyone, I'm really happy to be here today and sharing about my recent work with Svetlin Penkov and Dimitri Vasilev, which is in the field of artificial intelligence and concerns with how we can make neural networks learn more abstract logical reasoning. So let me first start with a brief observation of the Tazos quo. Well, currently neural networks can outperform human experts in tasks such as object recognition or strategy-based games like chess. However, this is only on individual tasks. This means that if we have an agent that can play chess, he then cannot play tic-tac-toe out of the go. However, uh, tic-tac-toe is a simpler game. And this is why we refer to neural, ne uh, neural networks as narrow intelligence. This means that neural networks are currently heavily specialized in one particular task and cannot really generalize their knowledge to other tasks. Well, in the future, we would like to uh, move towards general intelligence, which we can define as an agent's ability to achieve goal in a wide range of environments. Now, the key thing here is that last part, a wide range of environments. This means that we want our agent to be able, from a very small set of experience, to generalize to a much larger set of tasks. And this is what we normally refer to as human intelligence. So, why is this generalization to new tasks so important? Well, if we take autonomous driving as an example, on the road, an autonomous vehicle would see a stop sign in a lot of different orientations and in a lot of different weather conditions. And it is absolutely crucial that the neural network that operates the vehicle can recognize this stop sign consistently. However, at present, an, the same neural network can classify the same stop sign as either a dumbbell, a racket, and at 45 mile per hour speed limit. And this is one of the major uh, setbacks of autonomous driving and one of the major challenges in front of fully autonomous vehicles. Now, in order to measure performance on generalization, Francois Cholet developed the abstraction and reasoning corpus. This is a data set that consists of around 800 tasks and each of them is basically a logical puzzle that uh, the neural network needs to solve. It is actually very similar to an IQ test. So as we were talking before about uh, general intelligence and human intelligence, well, IQ tests are quite a familiar measure of human intelligence. And so if a neural network can solve this data set, which is similar to uh, IQ tests, then we can say that it is, um, much closer to general intelligence. Now, an example of a task from the abstraction and reasoning corpus is the crop task, as you can see on the slide. The ne neural network is presented with a grid on which some squares are colored and they form patterns. Now, one pattern in this grid is distinct from the others, and the job of the neural network is to find it and then crop it out. Now, humans can uh, derive this logic from very few samples, one or two maximum, and Going uh, and in line with that, the abstraction reasoning corpus only provides a maximum of five examples from which uh, the agent must learn. And then from the logical rule that it has inferred to apply it to a test. Now, the problem then becomes how can neural networks learn abstract principles? Because only through very abstract principles we can derive the logic that um, a transformation that solves such a puzzle. However, this question, there is no clear or definitive answer to it in AI research currently. So what we propose is that we look at the question backwards and actually think about how we can incorporate abstractions in neural networks. Now, our approach here is based on three levels of abstraction on which I'll go over now. The first level is meta-learning, which essentially means to learn a learning algorithm or to learn how to learn. Now, in humans, this is typically done in the first couple of years of school. Many people say that they do not really teach you anything, but they teach you how to learn. And a typical meta-learning setup for machine learning is as follows. The network is trained on multiple tasks, such as classifying birds from uh, cats or flowers from bikes. And after training on these tasks, it is then tested 
on a completely different task, but that is still related. So in this case, it is classifying dogs from otters. Now, the principle here that neural network must learn is how to classify two general objects. And it is this generality that provides our first level of abstraction. There are two main approaches in meta, in meta learning. One is memory based meta learning, and you do this every time you practice for the SAT reading task. So you read a text, you remember some information about it, and then you answer a question. And that's in essence what memory based meta learning does. On the other hand, we have optimization based meta learning, which in contrast is much more similar to how a pianist learns a new piece. So the pianist is already proficient at playing the piano and only needs one or two trials on a piece to learn it perfectly. And here are uh, more in-depth explanations of the two approaches. In memory-based meta learning, we use a memory augmented neural network that has addressing mechanisms towards a external memory array. And we use these addressing mechanisms to remember in essential information about the task and thereby adapt to the current task with additional information. On the other hand, we have optimization-based method learning, which instead aims to learn a set of parameters theta from which through very few gradient steps, it can derive the optimal parameters for each task. So that was the, second, the first level of abstraction. The second level of abstraction is the differentiable neural computer. Now, this is a memory augmented neural network, which is what is used in memory-based meta learning. However, in this case, we use it slightly differently. We use the external memory that it provides as a computational heap. And with this computational heap, we can actually implement true algorithms that can utilize variables. Now, variables as a computer science concept is, are very important for abstraction because they allow us to be agnostic to the data type that we're receiving. So going back to the classification of dogs and otters, in this case, uh, dogs would be a variable which is class one and the otters would be class two. And now the neural network does not operate with dogs and otters, but rather class one and class two. And this makes that, class, uh, that meta learning problem much simpler. Now, here is the third level of abstraction. It is avoiding overfitting. And overfitting in essence means to learn an overly complex function that does not generalize well when new samples are added to a data set. Now, this would be the middle, the middle plot on the figure you see on the slide. And this obviously hinders abstract learning because it, does, it, has, not, it has no good generalization performance because the function is overly complex and overly specialized to the particular data points in the data set. The key to preventing this is regularization. And this essentially means to add preference to functions which would be more general. And here we want to add preference to functions which are more abstract. However, this is very difficult to quantify. And therefore we use simplicity as a proxy for abstraction. We derive simpler functions by using something called spectral norm regularization. This is a regularization technique that places a penalty on large singular values and thereby derives functions which are as close to the linear function as possible and therefore simpler and therefore hopefully more abstract. Now our approach combines these three levels of meta learning and is shown on the two plots in orange. We test uh, our approach as well as three standard approaches for the field on two different scenarios. The first scenario is a single skill learning. So that is the only the crop task in all of its variants. And the second scenario is on all tasks in the data set, each of which has unique logic and some require different skills. In both scenarios, our approach outperforms baselines. And while its accuracy is not high enough to consider the data set solved yet, we do believe that this approach holds a lot of promise. And if I have to place my finger on something and call it mine in this approach, it would be this combination of the three levels of abstraction. But this is not strictly true since my work here at RSI is based on the support and the help of many people. And I was standing on the shoulders of the giants in the name of Svetlin Penkov, Dmitry Vasilev, and Rafael Rafailov, who helped me develop in the field of artificial intelligence and without whom this project would have never been possible. I would also like to acknowledge my tutor, Jane the Great Sendova, 
for being an inspiration and for always being there for support during this uh, whole experience. I would also like to thank Dr. Amy Silman for facilitating RSI, Shloko, Albert, Saroj, and Bashir for helping me with uh, my presentation and my, and my paper, uh, Katarina Velchova, Petr Gaidarov, and Konstantin Delchev for being there for support in Bulgaria, Elena Kisilova for being my teacher in, at my school, RSI, CE, and MIT, and all of the organizations that supported me and support CE and gave me the opportunity to be here today. Thank you all very much for the attention, and I would now be happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you so much, Victor, for the incredible presentation. Um, if any judges have any questions, please feel free to ask. Victor, thanks for your talk. Uh, just a quick question. You mentioned this corpus of uh, tasks, and you compared it to things like IQ tests. Now, you sort of, you know, what comes next in the sequence or what doesn't belong, questions in IQ tests are kind of notorious for not necessarily having unique answers. Do we know that there is a unique answer in this corpus of, of tests, or are we possibly penalizing our machine learner for finding answers that humans haven't? Uh, sorry, you were really cutting up a lot. Could you please repeat the question? I'm oh, sorry, something must be wrong with my audio. Uh, yes, I was saying, um, do, do we know that uh, this corpus of tasks on which you're testing actually has unique answers? Or is it ah, right, you know, right. better answers than the humans have found? Right, thank you very much uh, for the question, uh, Dr. Chairman. Uh, so the question was whether each task in the abstraction reasoning corpus has a unique solution. And the answer to that is uh, not necessarily. However, uh, the instance in which uh, tasks have two solutions which are based on abstract logic is very few and the likelihood of this happening are very few. Since in total we have around six examples and we need to formulate a logic that um, is able to uh, map the input to the output in all six examples. And given that uh, the abstraction reasoning corpus uses in total around 70 different skills in terms of uh, pattern expansion, uh, recognizing patterns and uh, manipulating them, uh, it is highly unlikely that there are two solutions to a given task. Does that answer your question? Yes, thank you. Thank you very much for the question. Hi. Um so thank you for the presentation. Uh, it's really interesting stuff trying to get computers to learn out of basic tasks. Um, I was wondering, just on the side, kind of in a lighthearted way, which piano players try one or two tries and then learn it perfectly. Um, <laughs> it usually takes me five or six or 10 or 20. Um, but my question is about, um, you know, I, I think it's really fascinating to look at this cat, bird, flower, bike, and does that make it, it more possible to tell the difference between dogs and otters? I know that some of these algorithms pick up on things like, you know, background images that are common between, you know, cats, and so actually they're picking up on things that are not actually part of the target number. And did we actually circle back to this dog otter result? And uh, can you explain the, the graph that you put up? I saw the orange one was lower. Is lower better in, these, in those graphs? Um, yes, so thank you very much for the question. Uh, so in, uh, the question was, uh, what is the measure in, through which we measure our results? And also, uh, in terms of the, uh, author and dog example, whether, uh, it is possible that the neural network actually learns some kind of shortcut, like for example, the background, do I have mm -hmm. this uh, correctly? Yeah, so there were two different kind of, two separate questions. One was yeah. like, how does this, how does this apply to the dog otter thing uh, when there's some problems with that kind of image recognition? And then also just like the, the simple ex explanation of your graphs. Yep. Yeah. Okay, thank you very much. So um, in the dog otter example, uh, yes, it is possible. And yes, it has been observed multiple times that the neural network learns uh, to classify object not based on the objects themselves, but rather on uh, features that are inherent to the data set. So for example, a famous example in literature is that one neural network learned how to classify cows based on a grass background, background behind them. And when a cow was not in, on a grass background, it could not classify it as a cow. And yes, this does happen. And this only highlights how important it is 
that we learn abstract features rather than overfitting to a data set. And in terms of our results, um, in this graph, it is measured the uh, loss in terms of uh, mean squared error. And yes, lower is better. And the graph uh, shows the loss over training time in epochs. The DNC MAML was better in both cases, the crop specific one and in the 800 tasks. Yes, that is correct. Uh, our approach, which we dubbed uh, DNC MAML, is uh, outperforms uh, baselines in both scenarios. Okay, and then would it be reasonable to assume that right when it starts leveling off, like uh, in on the left, you know, around 100 is actually where you sort of can say, hey, at this point, we've learned most of what we're going to learn and it doesn't make sense to, you know, double the number of epochs? Uh, yes, so uh, in this case, uh, learning, uh, ex decrease, learning um, the task decreases exponentially. So uh, there is a point where the learning is saturated and the network cannot really progress more. But we fixed uh, 200 epochs for the sake of consistency in our results. But yes, if the network was stopped at 100 epochs, it would still be, have uh, basically the same performance. Great, thank you. Thank you very much for your questions. Um, thank you so much, Victor, for the great presentation um, and questions. Thank you all for the attention.